I'm a small business, but I'm a good business. A place where you can get friendly people, friendly service, delicious barbecue. But my morning starts out early. I get here early in the morning, start with cleaning foils, mopping, sweeping. Because when you're on bottom in the restaurant business, you have to do a whole lot of work to try to stay on top. Overhead will kill you. So I have to do a lot of this work myself. But I love it, though. I'm proud of the, what we produce here. Uh, it's a lot of work. Like I said, it takes a lot of time. I come in at 4 in the morning, and uh, hopefully I'm done by 2 to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Most days I am. Well, who am I? John C. Bishop Jr., son of Big Daddy. So me and Dad hitchhiked to Selma from Birmingham, and Daddy, unbeknown what he was getting into, bought this restaurant. The first three months that we were open, I didn't sell any pork. People would come in, give me a barbecue sandwich. I'd say, I got brisket. Nah, I don't want brisket, I want barbecue, you know. And I'd say, well, that's all I've got. And some of them get mad and leave. So since 2009, I think we sold uh, a little over 46,000 Boston butts. My passion uh, for barbecue is a passion that my father had years ago, and his passion is my passion. When we, when we started this out, we didn't have anything, so we had nothing to lose. Nothing has changed from the counter to the back door in 58 years. I make a fire like I make a fire. I cook the food the way I cook the food. From the counter forward, oh yeah, we've changed. We don't wait on tables. We got a mobile app. No matter where you go, who you talk to, um, they, they'll be glad to tell you with a smile on their face where they came from, who has the best barbecue, and who's the pit, best pit master in the country. It is, it is absolutely phenomenal. People love to hear good blues when they're eating barbecue. So we name it Blues and Barbecue, come on day. We opened up this restaurant in January 2003, uh, just uh, after I had got uh, laid off from a job, really. Uh, so it was kind of a, of a blessing, you know, when that door closed, you know, I had to come up with something. It was Christmas time, you know, we didn't have any money, me and my wife and the kids, so that's what we came up with. And I had been previously, like, barbecuing out in the park with the kids or whatever. And then, you know, while we were doing that, some people come up and ask, could they buy a sandwich or something? That kind of, like, gave us an idea right there. And, and we started from there. Well, I got a phone call from my dad. That's how I started in the business uh, at an early age of about eight years old. And um, he called me down, said his uh, dishwasher didn't show up kind of something that happens a lot in the restaurant business. So I got the phone call and my mom brought me down and once I was down here I was okay. I kind of was in my comfort zone to begin with at home and I didn't want to come down but I did like it once I, once I finally came down. I used to do barbecue competitions. I started in 1993 and over the course of till about 2013 did about 250 competitions. Well, I, I came to Alabama mainly to be with my family, which was already living down here. Um, I had stayed back in Ohio to stay in competition. Um, and it definitely was worth it to be with the family. But getting into this culture of barbecue was something I didn't realize. Uh, people are set in their ways here. You know, they, they, like, they like very sweet food here, 
from up north when we're cooking, they it's more spicy. My dad said when he when he had the land out there by the hospital, he bought the land, sold the land out about the hospital and bought this here. He said two things gonna do. Build a restaurant or build a mortuary. I don't think I like I don't like dead folks too much though. But uh, he said <laughs> but it's money there though. It's money. Those who went through two names, they said we got them a funeral home or a restaurant. Thank God for the restaurant. <laughs> but it's <laughs> but it's money. He had a he had a good mind now. Sometimes I wish he had got a funeral home now though, because people dying every day and they're like crazy now, man. After high school I went to Johnson and Wales for culinary school in Charleston, South Carolina, and received an associate's in culinary arts. Came home, entered the workforce, did some fine dining and, and catering, lots of catering, um, and decided that I really wanted to do barbecue instead of that whole pretty free free world. <laughs> I've got cornstarch and sugar in here. And then I have coconut milk and milk. I'm gonna add, oops, sorry. I actually met my wife, Beth, when we were in culinary school freshman year. She was there to study baking and pastry hearts. I usually do all the baking in like the middle of the night because it's so just monotonous and boring and turn on music and dance around, do whatever. When we decided to open a restaurant, it was really neat that it could go hand in hand and she does all these different types of homemade desserts for us. Good pie takes time. I'm from a family of cookers, like I told you. My daddy was a cooker, my mom's a cooker, my uncles are cookers. All my, you know, my granddaddy's a cookers. I'm just, you know, bred it up in me was to cook, you know. I just, it was destiny, you know, cause it seemed like when I cook my food, it's great, you know, it ain't like, it's like, you know, if you ain't never tasted it, it's something to taste. I put it like that. I just put it, it's something to taste. Everything from scratch, nothing imported. Homemade coleslaw, homemade baked beans, homemade potato salad. We even got homemade banana pudding. We cooking it on the stove. This ain't that out of the box stuff. This real food here. When I started trying to define Alabama barbecue, I, I started with, with the person who eats it, which is just about everybody in the state. Everybody in the state has an opinion on it. Um, you know, if you live in Alabama, you have to be for Alabama or Auburn. If you live in Alabama, you gotta have a favorite barbecue joint just as well. Alabama barbecue takes the best of a lot of different regions and has worked with it for, um, you know, for a hundred years, bringing in all these different flavors and making them their own. It is, um, it is something that the South does right, but there are so many different versions of it that um, it's a little bit like a Southern accent. People who aren't from the South hear a Southern accent, to them it all sounds the same. But once you actually get into the South and you listen to the way people talk, you realize that there's a hundred different Southern accents. Arguably, there's a hundred different kinds of Southern barbecue, too. Uh, the difference is between an accent and barbecue is that everyone thinks their barbecue is the best. Big Bob Gibson was my grandfather. My mother was the Gibson. He actually had um, five children. They all went to the barbecue business. Luckily for me, my mom and dad went in business with my grandpa. So that's why I'm here today. You know, I'm from North Alabama originally, Florence, Alabama, about an hour from Decatur. So I grew up knowing the Big Bob Gibson name. Uh, I went to University of North Alabama in Florence, and that's where I met my wife. My wife happened to be Big Bob Gibson's great granddaughter. Like I said, he had five children. An aunt and an uncle went in business here in town, across town, and called their business Little Bob Gibson. Two other children went to Huntsville. And so now in Huntsville, there's a Gibson's barbecue and a David Gibson barbecue. And then since my mom and dad went in business with my grandfather, we got to keep, and I got to keep, the Big Bob Gibson name. We started in 1985, my father and I did. Uh, we bought a Pasquale's Pizza uh, location over in Southside. 
and uh, 30 days after we bought it, we got a cease and desist uh, certified letter saying they couldn't sell, transfer the franchise. Um, so we took the sign down and we were like, what are we gonna do? And uh, we decided we were gonna do barbecue. We started out in the trucking and cattle business uh, in Montgomery, right here close to us. And Dad and I used to run about 50 livestock trucks and we bought and sold cattle, hauled cattle, fed cattle commercially in the Texas Panhandle. And uh, we were started cooking for our youth group here at church and people started encouraging me that it was some pretty good barbecue. I just started barbecuing in the backyard like everybody else always does. And uh, so we had some guys that committed to an opportunity for us to open up a barbecue restaurant and it came to fruition about a year later. And uh, they bought this place and put us in here as tenants, not as partners. And we opened up Fat Boys Barbecue Ranch. When I was in the chemical business, we cooked a lot. And we cooked on weekends for uh, church functions and stuff like that. And so we had smoked a lot of meat for almost 30 years. We had kind of perfected what we wanted to do. And time just, you know, came about that we just decided we was going to go into barbecue business. And uh, it's a lot of difference. I mean, we were doing it for fun. And, and then when you start doing it for a living, it, it really takes, you know, takes a life of its own. Today we had two catering jobs and um, one of them was uh, 200 and one was uh, 500 and um, we basically had to have both of them out at the same time today and uh, it's been a pretty hectic day for us. A good day but hectic and uh, pretty stressful. We did about 250 pounds of chopped pork, probably 150 chickens, whole chickens, uh, dressings. 10 or 15 gallons of potato salad for one we did, 10 gallons for the other one, 24 gallons of green beans, 600 yeast rolls, 200 sliders for buns for one, and uh, about uh, 115 gallons of tea. Everything went well. We were we were pleased. Yeah, they were pleased. That's the biggest thing is, is customers pleased. Well, we came to Madison uh, 1990. I'm from Texas, and uh, I was in the oil field out there. I was a mud engineer for quite a few years. I got to barbecuing out around the rigs a little bit, and some of them would eat it, and some of them wouldn't. And so I just kept working at it, and. Uh, decided to move back here after I retired from the oil field because she's from here. And uh, so this building came open and I wasn't doing anything right then. So we decided to put in a little barbecue and see how it went. And it's just, it's been phenomenal. That's been a little over six years ago now. Most of my life, all my life, I was a mechanic doing mechanic work on University for Stockton Buick, building automatic transmissions and the river area in the 220 Buicks. I've done that for 27 years. Stockton Buick University. And uh, Mr. Stockton, he passed away. And when he passed away, I started Melvin's Auto, my own bid in Melvin's Auto. And as time went on with Melvin's Auto, I've done that a lot of years. I started messing with barbecue sauce. And, uh, and the barbecue sauce brought us all here together today. The barbecue sauce messing with this meat. When I was a girl, we had a stockyard out in East Selma. And I had a bicycle with a basket on it. And I used to go out to the stockyard and get the hog and the man would tie his feet and everything and put it in the basket. And I would bring it back home, and they would kill the hogs. My stepfather, he started digging a pit in the yard and uh, put the wire over the 
you know, the, the pit. And that's the way he did the barbecue. Now we sell it out of the house, you know, big sandwiches and all. So my daddy came to Birmingham probably in the uh, late 30s. Like a lot of people, Birmingham was the magic city, and he met my mom, Maxine. My mom grew up during the Depression, and her mother used to cook meals and take in borders, and that's how they got through the Depression, was preparing food and selling it. Daddy went off to war, as all the men did, and probably didn't see each other for over three years. Uh, but my mama, it, during that time, went to work for Belcher McComb, and she started wiring the B-25 bombers, and she was so good at that that she became the head wiring inspector, and she inspected all the wiring on the B-25s. I say that to say this. My mother was never gonna stay at home and raise children and wash clothes. My mother was already a businesswoman. She wanted to make money. She wanted to control her destiny. She liked making business decisions. This wasn't that common back then. Uh, Mama said one of the greatest disappointments of her life was when all the men came home and they called them in one morning and said, we don't need y'all anymore. And uh, boom, it's over with. Caitlin, my fiance, she and I met in Tuscaloosa. Well, we actually uh, took a direct tip from the tornado in 2011. We were in Forest Lake. That was scary. We pushed the couches up against the doors and everything. We were all in the hallway with pillows and mattresses on top of us, and everything started shaking. The doors started, you could just like hear like the wind was just like sealing them shut. It was the scariest thing. We were hearing trees crack, and we were all looking up. We didn't know where the trees were going to land. and. Then all of a sudden it was over. But we went outside and just everything was demolished. We couldn't even get out the front door because a tree was in the front of it. We had to go out the back and go around and just everything was gone, everything. Naturally, after the tornado, any time a storm would pop up, we would have anxiety being up there. So we decided we'd move down here where we do have hurricanes, but at least we have a little notice, you know? I mean, the tornadoes just pop up on you and it brought us down here, which eventually led to us uh, taking ownership of Hogwild Barbecue. Wanted to put a little different twist on Southern Barbecue, have a little beachy twist. So we try to be unique with everything we do. It's amazing. And everybody thinks I just say that, but I wouldn't have anything on our menu that didn't taste good. The first time we cooked, we had all of my family come in here and to try everything. And we couldn't believe how good it was. We were like, dang, we can cook. Well, there was a service station back in the early 70s. When Frederick came along in 79, it destroyed the station and the pumps. My father worked on, my father was a mechanic and uh, he worked on cars. Well, I was working at a local paper company and we were on strike. And I decided to come in the parking lot and build me a pit. And I started barbecuing. So after the strike, uh, I came back a couple of times and I said, Dad, I can't do this. I'm working midnight shift. So I uh, stopped barbecuing. And he said, well, baby, these people are still coming. What am I going to do? And so he decided to build the pit, the first pit back there. And we went into the barbecue business. And that was the beginning of Magnum Barbecue. In the beginning, when I uh, when I started, and uh, you know, like I said, I was learning how to cook. And what I would do is I would go out and look in the trash and see what people threw away. So that's how I knew I wasn't cooking, because you would see you see some ribs or something somebody threw away, and I would see like some blood, and I was like, oh, they wasn't done, so that's why they didn't eat them. So I knew I had to go back and practice cooking on that a little more. We have 34 locations now. The main reason why we grew was to um, give our employees an opportunity to be a partner. And so we have a operating partner in every market that we're in, um, which we don't franchise. It's a family-owned business, and they're 
skins in the game and they treat their business just like it's theirs, because it is. So it's been able, to, even though we've got, our family's gotten bigger, we still think small. And it's made a big difference for the success of the business. Restaurant business is a tough, competitive business. And when we split out and my uncle went to Collinville and left me here, it, it's a lot of work on one guy, you know what I'm saying? I got a good crew that works hard, but like I said, I'm here, you might as well say eight days a week. Man, I never would figure that I'd be doing it. I worked at plants, I did all type of stuff, man, but being my own boss ain't nothing like it, man. Ain't, it's a lot of work in it, but ain't nothing like it, man. When me and Unc come here five years ago, he was trying to decide what he was gonna name it. And he went home and watched that Dewey Cox story. And Dewey Cox was a magician trying to get started in the business, and he kept having stumbling falls, stumbling falls, and everybody telling him he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it, you can't do it. You know, same way they were telling my Uncle Joe, you can't do it, you can't do it. And when Dewey made that hit song, Walk Hard and Went to the Top, Uncle said, that's what we're gonna do, we're gonna walk hard to the top in the barbecue business. And that's why I say, until you taste this, mm, ain't nothing like it. Barbecue really goes back to the very earliest days of the state of Alabama. Um, barbecue is something that Europeans picked up from Native Americans really from the very earliest years of contact in the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, Native American tradition was to cook on, to smoke over coals. Um, Europeans traditionally were more in the, the roasting game of things. Um, but, um, but they picked up pretty quickly that this was a technique that they could apply to their own cuisine. And so by the 17th century, you have colonists in places like Virginia who are roasting, you know, who are smoking a pig over an open coal. Um, and that is something that by the time you get to the early 19th century, when you have the first, really the first uh, waves of European migration, uh, the first waves of African slaves who are brought with Europeans to places like the Alabama Territory, they're already bringing that custom and tradition with them. Um, they're using, early on it's not exclusively pork barbecue, it becomes pork barbecue traditionally over the course of time, but early on Alabamians would barbecue pretty much anything, um, any animal that's really available. Um, pigs were wild, um, they were cheap, they were plentiful, so pig was probably the most prevalent, but you see references to people barbecuing things like mutton, um, goat, um, any kind of animal that really could be made into food, they would, they would barbecue. Smoking daily. Tim Walker Barbecue. When you see this smoke, it ain't no joke. So we've got our, our Boston butts here over the flame currently, and we're getting a, some nice color on those, getting a sear on the outside. Uh, we've also got our, our St. Louis cut ribs here off to the side, getting good smoke color on them right now. And we've got half chickens and our turkey breasts all smoking at the moment. Um, so this is the part people kind of try to avoid by having a nice big southern pride smoker is we have real fire down here that we have to kind of tend to and, and make sure that it's not burning everything on, on the pit. Pit versus smoker is a great question. I got to tell you, I am, there's some purists out there. I'm going to shock you, but I'm an in-between guy. I think the smoker has a purpose if you know how to dial it in and use it. And I don't think you're not a true barbecue guy if you have a smoker in your restaurant. I myself prefer a commercial style cooker, which has got gas assist, wood, uh, thermostat control, the uh, temperature, uh, I can keep the temperature exactly where I want it, versus the uh, big pits that people might carve out of an old gas tank and smoke. Um, those do a nice job, but it's hard to get that consistency there where you may get more toughness uh, and your texture can be a little grisly. Some people use a commercial smoker and if it works for them, that's great. But I just simply don't believe you can come up with the same product. Um, I did look at one a while back that's, uh, that's natural gas and you just load the meat into the pit and turn the gas on at night and come back in the morning and your meat's cooked. And uh, that takes all the personal touch out of it, all the character, if you ask me. You're able to set your temperature on these 
it has a digital setting and uh, so you're able to maintain pretty well a constant temperature which helps in the cooking process because you don't have to uh, stay up with it like you used to back in the old days when we just had the strict wood burners. It's not a set it and forget it type thing where you can say I want my pit to be 275 degrees exactly at all times. It's more of a hey it's hot over here and it's not over here kind of thing. So it's really more of a, an art than a science because you have to pay attention to it. You have to have a feel for what you're doing. We're using a, a rotisserie gas-fired wood fired pit now as most all restaurants are. You bigger ones. I mean that's what's revolutionized the barbecue business is these, these pits. Old Hickory and different ones. Um, it eliminates labor, eliminates uh, overcooking and that kind of stuff. But in my heart, I like the old shovel the coals under the meat. Uh, you get a lot better bark and that kind of stuff. But as much as we sell, it, uh, it's just a thing of the future. That's what it is. To me, a smoker is what a conveyor oven is to a pizza. It cooks a good pizza. And it comes out on the other end just about the same every time. I'm more the guy that's got that brick-fired pizza oven that's sticking that paddle under there going, hey, I think the fire's a little hotter over here on the right. Let me push this over here a little bit. Let me, I, I gotta put another log on here. I, and, and when that pizza comes out, each one is almost different because you've sat there and hand done it. The smoker, the pit is the same analogy. You've got to stand there and subjectively think, open the right door that far and slide that part of that door that far open. And when you've stood there all those years, you understand when you open the right side, the left side gets hot. You know, here's something else people don't realize. A barbecue pit burns different every day. Uh, what's the dew point outside? How's the wind blowing? What's the temperature? You know, when there's a high humidity point, it's hard to get a fire to burn. But when there's a low dew point, a low humidity, you got heat coming out the wazoo over there. So there's a subjective call in it. It's really not about just you know, starting fire and throwing the meat up there. there. There really is, at one point or two in the cooking process, you've got to make a couple of decisions that are going to affect the way that comes off the pit, even though it's what you do every day. You know, you have a choice when it comes to barbecue, and uh, a lot of people don't see it that way. They say, think that uh, a direct fire and direct grilling and barbecue two totally different things, and you can't uh, intermingle the two. I, I certainly don't believe that. Take, for instance, the whole barbecue chickens. You actually get some residual drippings off the chicken and some renderings going down and hitting the hot coals, okay? So you get a certain charred moisture that you just can't get cooking exclusively with indirect heat. Uh, I think it gives uh, our chickens and our pork and just a little bit extra punch uh, here at the restaurant. So I, I like versatility when I cook. So I certainly believe that there's a need in barbecue for both direct and indirect heat. Basically just our primary pit, everything's over hickory. Um, we do the chicken and ribs on this. As you can see we've got some that are coming off right here right now. Um, they're generally about, say, like four to six hours, just depends on the cut of meat, depends how much fat's in it, to, just to, you know, to get a good, it's a feel. So there's probably like a seven to ten minute window on it before they're either going to be underdone or overcooked. So we just have to keep an eye on it. And these guys do it enough that they can just feel them and they know when they're ready to go. These are our auxiliary smokers. It's what we use for the pull pork. Just for the sheer volume we do, we can't do it all on the pit. So these will basically hold about three cases of pork a piece. And these are generally running five days a week. You know, Big Bob Gibson started back in the t early 20s cooking in his backyard in a, a literal pit in his backyard. Um, but when we came to the restaurant, we had to take that pit and actually elevate it. So now we actually got sort of like a brick coffin. Oh, nice. Those chickens are ready to go. We cook all hickory wood. If you'll notice our fire is on this side right here and all our coals and we will draft all the heat and smoke across the chickens and then go up the flue on this side. We've got both a chimney 
over the fire and then we've got a flue on the other side so we can control exactly how much heat and smoke comes across our chicken so we can control the temperature with airflow. When the pit guys get here in the morning, usually we drop on about 75 whole chickens. Uh, and that's just to get us to the beginning of lunch. As soon as these come off, we're going back on with another 75. A hot sizzling fire is really important when you're cooking, uh, uh, actually when you're putting the sauce on these ribs, you're, get, you're caramelizing the sauce. So if you don't have a flame, it won't sizzle that sauce right into the rib. So that's, that's one thing we do here. We cook with a hot grill. Even though this meat has been smoked for uh, numerous hours, this is the finishing process here. And this gives that skin a nice crusty outside, keeps the meat nice and juicy on the inside. When we're talking about the cooking process here at Dreamland, the fire dictates that entire process because we don't, we don't cook with smoke or steam, we cook with direct heat. So the bigger the fire, the faster the ribs and smaller and so on and so forth. So like I said, that's why we try to focus on everybody cooking with a good even base fire. That way we, we can heat our whole pit up. That way all our ribs cook at not the same time, but the same temperature and speed. We've done our first flip, which is when we try to um, sear the meat side of the rib before we flip it over to cook it through the bone side. And when, when I mean meat side, I mean this, this, this top half of the meat right here, the part that you actually would eat, as opposed to the bone side, which will be what's left when you get done. The pit requires so much attention and a man at it, you know, attending it at all times, because the fire can get wild. It can be burning one second and docile the next, and it's wood, and it's hickory wood. It'd be a lot more efficient for us if we were inside. Um, it's not very much fun in the rain. We do have tents, as you can see, but uh, when it rains, you get wet. And, uh, but the, the thing about having a smoke right here is that when the wind is right and the smoke just kind of sits on the road, uh, business is, goes up about 20%. And you know, we have people up and down the road. We had one guy come in when they said, good God, I've been driving up and down this road. I gotta have something to eat. The smoke's killing me. Uh, you want all the heat in the morning. You do all the heat in the morning, then like say around 12 o'clock, uh, hopefully it's all burned down to coals and just rest, you spend the rest of the day with just a low, slow fire after that. But it needs to be hot in the morning, get all the big part of the cooking done then. The technique is uh, low temperatures, slowly cooked for a long time. And then that way the meat breaks down and, and develops more and better flavor. So if you want to look at it in temperatures, basically it's between 185 and 200 degrees is that kind of low cooking temperature. You know, if you want that pork ultimately to be up to 185, 190 degrees, well, if you don't ever have the fire much hotter than that, it's going to cook for a long time and, and it will become really flavorful and juicy. And so I'm a, I'm a kind of a big proponent of long, slow cooking at low temperatures. A lot of people talk about pool pork. I'm not sure what that is. We've been doing this a long time before they ever started talking about pool pork. But what we do is a disassemble the shoulder, take it apart uh, piece by piece. We'll clean it off. Any fat that's on it, we take that off. And if there has to be, happens to be something hard, we cut that off. So that by the time it gets to the customer, it's pure meat. There's no fat, no waste at all. It's 100% pork. You go back to the earliest days when people referenced barbecue, wrote about barbecue, talked about barbecue. Um, it was often tied very tightly to politics in the state of Alabama. So it would be an excuse to pull voters together, essentially, um, a place where candidates could speak to voters, party a little bit with voters, um, treat the voters, right? Um, and that goes back really to the 18th century, that custom of, of elites, and elites tended to be the ones who were running for office, um, really providing food and often drink as well for voters. Um, and so barbecue um, originally in the state seems to have happened most commonly in a political context. Um, 
a race for public office, all the candidates come together, speak to the voters, and people will come together if you can provide them with a free meal. But there definitely are stories of the way politicians relate to barbecue that can go very well and they can also go very poorly. Um, you know, there's a story about um, uh, John Tyler Morgan when he was running for an office very early in his career. He gets up there at a barbecue and he starts giving a speech and about halfway through the speech apparently he just abandoned it and he sort of jumped off the stage and decided that they were going to eat first and talk later. And that worked out really well for him as you can imagine. Uh, voters, voters really liked that quite a bit. On the flip side of things you had in the, the late 1820s um, barbecue actually became sort of controversial politically. Um, there were uh, people particularly in, in and around Huntsville, which was one of the more populated portions of the state then, uh, there were people who felt that, that treating the voters, um, having politics that was so democratic that really any white man could participate in it, it was unseemly somehow. It seemed um, undignified for politicians to, um, to, to sort of cater to voters literally and figuratively at a barbecue and so there was a campaign to try to stamp that out to try to say that politics and, and barbecue really shouldn't be the way it goes and people should vote on the merits rather than on how good a meal that they get. So one of the newspapers in Huntsville apparently challenged um, all the candidates in one race uh, to abstain, to not go to political barbecues for, for this race. I think it was a treasurer's race but I'm not, I'm not positive about that. So there's nine candidates the way the story goes. Only one of them refused to attend the barbecue, he finished seventh out of nine. Um, whether or not he would have done better if he'd gone to the barbecue is unclear, but not going clearly didn't help. Okay. This is a good part about making good barbecue. Okay. Make sure it's turned the right way. Okay, let's just discuss some wood. I mean, Basically, let's clear it up. Hickory is indigenous in Birmingham. Mesquite is good for Texans, but I can't get mesquite over here. It's going to cost me a fortune. And people mention the word pecan. I mean, people need to look that up and Google that because pecan and hickory are the same. So let's just establish that Birmingham is hickory. It has a great flavor. If you put your hand over the hickory smoke fire and just just smell the aroma right afterwards, you'll understand that it is, it penetrates deep into the meat. We don't need another wood. There's not some magical unicorn wood out there somewhere. It's hickory for Birmingham and it does just fine. Around here is a lot of hickory, um, but up north we get a lot of pear and, and cherry and apple wood. You can pretty much use any good fruit wood or hardwood uh, to, to kind of adjust your flavors. You know, when people ask me about wood and barbecue, I always give the advice, uh, select a wood that is native to your area and learn to cook with it. For us, it's hickory. It's what we've been using here since, in uh, Big Bob Gibson since 1925. We use hickory. Straight hickory. Hickory smoke. Hickory wood. Oak and pecan. Charcoal is our main source of heat. Uh, we, so we put uh, pecan wood on top to smoke. It's really hard to find someone that uh, can give me a steady supply of hickory wood. Uh, I've got some wood out there now that's elm. A guy brought and unloaded that was supposed to be hickory, and then when I got here, I saw it was elm and tried to get him to come back and get it, and he wouldn't. But I have a real good man now. He has a, a sawmill over in uh, Cleveland, and he knows what a hickory is, and he's prompt, and he cuts it, cuts it the size I want and the length I want. That's a big part of it. When the wood is right, it, it cuts way down on the amount of work I have to do. A lot of people tell you, well, when you're cooking barbecue, you got to have the hickory or the, you know, the oak and hardwood. This gives you the flavor, but it's what you put on it that makes the barbecue. So you, anybody can cook barbecue, but it's the sauce that you put on that makes it what it is. We have about seven different sauces. Uh, we have a, a sweet sauce, tangy sauce. We have a fire in a hole, which name explains everything. And then we've got a uh, Carolina sauce, a kusabi sauce, a white sauce. We've had people come in that's never eaten here, and they'll line every one of the sauces up, and they'll try every one of them. I don't want that sauce to cover up all that work that I've been doing over there. And if you put too much sugar in it and you make it too sweet, 
I could have just cooked that in the oven and you'd have the same thing. Well, we have very unique sauces. We have a, pie, a barbecue pineapple sauce, which is very unique. And we have uh, sweet and tangy, all of our sauces. Um, and our butts are, you know, we use not an extreme amount of salt, but we do make it a little saltier than most because, you know, the gulf and everything with salt water. The sauce, ain't nothing like my sauce. I got homemade sauce I make from scratch. And man, I'm telling you, I call it that comeback sauce. And once you come here and you try it, you usually come back. One of the things I did when I was researching the book was to eat the meat and not sample the sauce until the very last thing. Because if the meat doesn't have the flavor, then it doesn't really succeed. A real rib is without the sauce, you know. You eat out the grill. Get the regular taste. Sauce had sauce had a bad rib. I'm like the hickory smoke, you know. People don't, people don't, well, the sauce is good, true enough, but if you want to try real barbecue, eat it without the sauce. That's a true real. Sauce wasn't defined in Birmingham in the 50s, so there were three restaurants that kind of defined it, and it was a tomato-based sauce. So what happened was after the 50s, 60s, 70s, the definition was in, and this is part of our, uh, I would say, tradition. People ask me why I don't have a white sauce, a vinegar, because I'm traditional and I'm staying toward staying true to the tr tradition that we've helped establish. We helped formulate it and define it. So it's a tomato-based sauce in Birmingham, Alabama. And one thing that sets North Alabama apart is Big Bob Gibson and the barbecue white sauce, his original white sauce. And that's what we're known for in North Alabama, as well as cooking whole shoulders and, and things. So we really hang our hat on our, uh, on our barbecue white sauce. Have I tasted some of the other sauces? I can tell you this, as far as white sauce, mayonnaise and vinegar doesn't, doesn't, set, doesn't set my world on fire. I mean, no. I think our sauce is way more complex. You could probably give that recipe to somebody. Okay, put salt, pepper, mayonnaise, and vinegar together and just stir it in a bowl. But if I told you my sauce, it would be way more complex. And it's uh, a balance of ingredients that is moving toward a perfect sauce. And I firmly believe that the barbecue should stand by itself. The sauces, they're an option for our customers. Trying to trace back when particular barbecue techniques are pioneered um, can be tricky. Uh, the, the, the sources that tell you things about barbecue, the further back you go, the less specific they tend to be. Um, so you're not going to find barbecue recipes from before the Civil War, by and large. Um, you're not going to find, um, you know, certain kinds of sauces and specifically how those things were made. My fifth great-grandfather, if it goes back that far, which would be in the early 1800s, uh, had this sauce in California during the gold rush times. and. It passed down from generation to generation, and my father eventually ended up with it, and we tweaked it a little bit with a little extra this and left something out. And, and as of what we have today is Hancock barbecue sauce. Back whenever I was a kid, uh, I wanted to learn how to barbecue. And there was an older man in uh, the town we lived in named Red Sanders. And everybody just called him Mr. Red. He was an old black man. And uh, so I went down to him and said, Mr. Red, I'd like to learn how to cook barbecue. Can you teach me? And he said, I can't teach nobody nothing, but if you come work for me, I'll show you some things. He would show me stuff, and, and he kept, he always had a philosophy. He'd say, you got to know what's going on inside there with that fire and with that meat. And he had great barbecue. People come there, and he only cooked so much a day. When he ran out, he was out. But anyway, Mr. Sanders had that barbecue sauce. And uh, when uh, he got ready to pass on, I guess he kind of knew it was getting close, he handed me an old piece of paper, and I still got that. Had that recipe on it. And uh, even his son didn't get it, because his son wouldn't come down and help him out. And I don't want to say much about that in case he happened to see this. I don't want to make him feel bad. But it, uh, he come and asked me if I had the recipe, and I said, yeah. And he said he wanted it. And I said, if your daddy wanted to give it to you, he'd let you have it. He gave it to me. About eight years ago, I was introduced to a gentleman by the name of Bill Nyman, which is the godfather of the uh, local food movement. Um, he's out of California. And uh, he came down to Birmingham. We rode around 
state of Alabama, Mississippi, and we were trying to locate pig farmers. And there was very few. And so I decided at that point that we needed to get that fixed. You know, quality of pork really has gone down for decades and decades up until the last 10, 15 years. And now we're getting some of our better places that are sourcing better quality pork that to me is very, very uh, important and is a big step in the right direction. The interesting thing to me about the Fatbag Pig Project is that a lot of the narrative today in American food is about, you know, heirloom varieties of pigs. And, uh, you know, everybody talks about the importance of reviving these heirloom varieties of pigs. The way Southerners talk about it is we're going to start farming the way our grandparents farmed. We're going to start raising the same pigs our grandparents raised. They're, you know, our history, our legacy. Um, and I think that's what's smart about what Nick is doing. There's a big difference in local and locale. So you won't find avocado farms in the state of Alabama, but there's not a better place to raise hogs than our state. And so we use four million pounds of pork a year, and we feel like that we have an opportunity to offer farmers the ability to be successful and grow and make money. Um, it just It's just gonna take time to build that infrastructure. I would love to, to see the day when more Alabama barbecue used Alabama-raised hogs that were raised by farmers that made a good living and the, the hogs were well taken care of. And that when we eat local barbecue, indeed we are eating local barbecue and not just mass-produced commodity hogs that have been uh, inside some confinement pen for all their life. We want the hogs to be raised like they would live naturally. Um, they're healthier, they uh, get to run around. Um, so the meat, when you get the meat, it's a very dark red, very marbled meat versus the campaign several years back where they said pork's the other white meat. It's not the other white meat, you know, and it should have never been that. You want well marbled pork that has big flavor. And the older breeds have incredible flavor. The meat's a little darker. The intermuscular fat or marbling is much better. I just thought it was a pretty sad thing to be in this part of the country where it's, a na it's such a natural uh, you know, place to, to farm. And we weren't farming but it's putting people back to work, it's putting farmers back to farming. And uh, I think it's a great opportunity for us as a state to make a statement to get that going again. As far as barbecue places go, and as, as restaurants, you know, you've got to have dessert. There are places that really put a lot of care and love into their cooking. They're definitely going to put it into their desserts. And I think about, you know, to me, one of my favorites is lemon meringue pie. And so when you go into a barbecue place and you see this meringue all over this sweet lemon custard cracker crust, you know, I love that. What's really interesting about this pie filling is that it'll go from being liquid to being gel in a matter of no time. So you just have to keep your eye on it and be really, really careful. It's turned into the gel like I was talking about. I've got egg yolks here in this bowl and I'm just gonna mix some of this filling in with the um, egg yolks, it's called tempering, so that um, when I pour it back in the pot, the eggs don't scramble. My egg whites have started to um, foam up, so now I'm gonna add some salt and some cream of tartar to help stabilize the egg whites. We've had an entire cream pie go flying across the restaurant before and hit someone in the face, honestly, because someone tripped. That was fun. 
here at Chez Fon Fon, of course, we put a, a lot of our desserts out front. So a lot of it is that visual appeal of seeing a dessert that, you know, kind of pulls you in. Barbecue has become something that has really exploded beyond the South in the last 20 or 30 years, I think, and has become sort of a, a almost a, a national phenomenon. Um, not in the sense necessarily that you'll see barbecue places everywhere, although you can find barbecue places in some very unusual spots, um, parts of the country you would not expect to see it. Barbecue does seem to be a thing that, that can draw people to the South um, in a way that I don't think it, it did in previous generations. Everyone knew that the heart of barbecue was in the South, but you see way more in terms of um, books, television shows, um, cook-offs, competitions, and you know, you go to a barbecue competition, there's teams come from everywhere, all over the country, sometimes from not even in the United States. But barbecue, for whatever reason, has gone from being something that's just sort of iconic of the South and really is something that, um, that has come out of the South and now appeals to the rest of the world in a way that, that I don't think you would have seen certainly not 40 or 50 years ago, and I'd venture to say probably not even 20 or 30. We're in the midst of a real renaissance now in American barbecue, Alabama barbecue. There's better barbecue being cooked now than when I was growing up. More people care about it. More people are dedicating their lives to growing good pigs and cooking good barbecue. So the prospects are great. Barbecue is going to continue to change, going to continue to evolve. People are curious about the South in general. Our region, like no other region in America, has a mystique about it. It's a little scary to some people. Uh, it's, it's intriguing to people because we don't fit the way the rest of the country sees themselves. And uh, we have an interesting history, a complicated history. And so people are curious as to what the South is about, what Alabama is about, and so they know that they have some preconceived notions, and, and they come and they want to find out if those notions are true or not. And barbecue is a great way for us to welcome people in so that they can see something that really started in the South, and that is, I, I think, the excellence is unique to our state. I think Southerners have a sense of pride about our connectedness to each other through barbecue in how all different types of people, different colors, different uh, people of different incomes come together and are all the same at a barbecue joint. And I think food brings us together in a way, and I think barbecue does that in a very special and wonderful way. I have not had anything like Alabama barbecue or even Southern barbecue outside of the U.S. I've had some good smoked meats, um, around, but nothing like this. This is a very specific type of food that is made only in one place, and it is ours. Barbecue is, is not just a job. It's a life. Barbecue is a lifeblood for me. It's uh, what what's keeps, keeps me going. It's what I do every day during the week. It's what I do on the weekends as a hobby. When you see somebody grab a rib and, and really enjoy it, it's just, it's pretty neat. You know, it's kind of like a baseball player hitting a home run. I started in the business when I was 19. I'm 57 now and I love, it's part of my life. It's part of my family's life. It's not a job. It's a way of how we live our lives. So I couldn't be happier. People comes in all the time telling us that, well, we don't have any food and we're hungry. I'll fix them something to eat, you know. Give them something to eat. Because a lot of people are less fortunate. So you have to help one another. And that way the Lord keep on blessing you. The best fun part about this is my customers. Uh, we interact with everybody and take time off to go sit down and be with them and, and uh, they like that. They like the, old, the personal touch. We care about this, you know. You gotta care about something in order to have a good livelihood out of it, right? You don't care about your job, you can't have nothing good about it, right? So that's what it is though. 
try to steal people's livelihoods. That's we, you know, put a lot of TLC in it. You know, it's a privilege to be working at Dreamland. Barbecue matters in Alabama as a totem of black and white, um, and it's a shared creation. That's why it resonates. It's one of the reasons Southern food resonates, is because black and white can see their hands on our food. I mean, this is my life. Literally, if you took this restaurant away, I would have to find another purpose. I couldn't just go to another job because I was bred to do this. I mean, at eight years old, your dad calls you in and you work with him for 20 years side by side. He mentors you. And this is the only job I've ever had. So this is it. As far as barbecue goes, it's the true American food. Give me the recipe and teach me how to make the sauce. <laughs> no, I can't do that. You tell me how to make it? I will not tell you how to make it. I'm the only person with a recipe, by the way. Will you uh, give me your recipe and teach me how to make that myself? No, sir. <laughs> no, I won't get a recipe. Uh, I can't. I, I'd have to keep that to myself, Ray. I can tell you which one I like. It's ain't, uh, it takes a stangy, but I can't tell you what's in it. <laughs> I can't do that. I wish I could. I, w I really do, but I can't. You tell me how to make your sauce? No, I ain't gonna tell you how to make my sauce, but I tell you what, you can come 305 Industrial Boulevard and buy you a quart of it, or a gallon of it, whatever you like. Oh, I'm sorry, no, I can't tell you how to make my sauce. That's the old saying, if I do, I have to kill you. <laughs> you. You know better than to ask if you can have the recipe for the sauce. <laughs>